Welcome to Invisible Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction. I am your host, Dean Anderson. And on today's show, we have somebody who's going to share uh, some intimate and vulnerable information about their own journey. And I'm really happy to have him on the show today. We have Trevor Hopkins. Hey, Trevor. Hi, Dean. How are you? Great. How are you? Twice this week, I've had the pleasure of seeing you. Yeah. I've had the pleasure of seeing you twice this week. Oh, it's yes. good. <laughs> of course you did. <laughs> so um, we we don't have a lot of people on the show that are uh, talking very specifically about their lived experience. And they're, I mean, we, so that's kind of a half truth. We do have people that talk about it, but it's very rare that I have people on the show specifically for that. It's usually some sort of um, correlation with some sort of specific job environment or something that they do or they work in the field or something like that mm. so you know i have you on today's show just solely for the purpose of talking about your lived experience and what your addiction journey has been like so that's why i introduced you the way i did because it takes a lot to be able to be vulnerable and share that information so i appreciate that and you being on here i um, welcome. yeah so uh, i would love it if we can just jump right into um, you know, what it is that recovery means to you. Like, what is that idea when we're talking about addiction recovery? Um, what, is, what does that mean to you? It's my life uh, and I apply it to everything. It's not just addiction anymore. Mm -hmm. And the, everything I've learned in, in AA and, and, um, and Westover Treatment Center, it, it's, it's applied to everything in life. Mm -hmm. All of my teachings, it's, and, and now it's, my, my new family is all, AA. So my recovery is, uh, I'm getting nervous now. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, na that's totally natural and it's okay. And it's okay. Yeah. Um, we expect that. So there's a, there's a, a lot to it then. So, I mean, the, uh, Laird at Westover, he says, you know, only one thing has to change and that's everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so and it's all encompassing. Yeah. yeah. So I gave you a big question there kind of right out of the gates. Yeah. So it's a lot to chomp on. I could answer that in an hour or two. We don't just have that much time right now, but I, I, I yeah. yeah, I get that. Is there anything that you know that stands out to you in your um, kind of day-to-day -day life that you would, um, you know, constitute as you know the most important or one of the most important things? Well, letting go of the control is oh, okay. probably the most important. It's something that I've been focusing on for the last eight, ten months, and mm -hmm. and it's working. I, I live stress-free now. I tell everyone mm -hmm. I. I don't really have stress. I, I don't get frustrated by the little things anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I have to focus on every day as well and be mm -hmm. grateful for that I've lost the control and mm -hmm. I can drive down the road without road rage. And I learned all that from, from Laird, we'll say. <laughs> can, you, can you teach me that now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <clears throat> I'm teaching everyone that one day at uh, a time. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen the construction in London. That's a hard <laughs> feat. <laughs> it, it, it is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you attribute to that? What is it? So... I mean, living stress-free is uh, is a tall order, but I mean, uh, living that idea of you know being in a, in a in a way less stressful state on a regular basis is um, you know if we could bottle that up and uh, get the pun, the joke here. Yeah, 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 bottle, yeah, yeah. If yeah. we could bottle it up, uh, but that's a really a really big deal to a lot of people. I mean, that's one of the largest causes of. Um, illness and 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 problems in the world is people's level of stress. So, mm -hmm. what do, what are you what are you doing? Like, how is that? How do you have how do you apply that? I just have faith. That I, I can't control everything. I, mm -hmm. The Adelaide train bridge is going to get built, and if I get stuck behind it like I did today, mm -hmm. there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. I I still here on time. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, yeah, I just I just have to let go of it all. And I had no idea I was a control freak before. Mm -hmm. and no idea. I didn't know I was selfish. I didn't. There a lot of things I didn't know about myself. Mm -hmm. and once I started to learn about myself, and the need for alcohol or any kind of escape went away. What um, you know? Why do you think it is? Why do you think that we have that that I'm going to say naive uh, or unawareness of what we are and who we are? What do, you, what do you think contributes to that? Why is it that it's, you know, I don't know that I'm selfish. And then all of a sudden I found out, oh, shit, I am. And yeah. I just, I just swore. <laughs> <laughs> I have to beep that one out. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Um, it's, it, again, that's a long conversation. Um, I don't have anything on that one. No? No. Okay. 
uh, it's, uh, uh, I think that what we, we tend to see when we work in the field is it's a lot to do with, um, coping. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for me to ignore the emotions I'm having and create a different narrative in my head mm -hmm. than it is to face the reality and the truth of what's going on. So exactly. we kind of change that narrative of what's going on in our life. And I think that that's what it ends up being. I know I'm guilty of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> how did you, how did you cope and deal with that idea when it did happen? Like when you, when you all of a sudden found out and came to the realization that, you know what, I'm not acting the way I think I am, or I'm doing things differently. Well, you know, when, what was that like? Yeah. Well, when I, when I realized how selfish I was, I became selfish. <laughs> so I, I, I basically took the, the negative selfish person away and okay. eventually got rid of the bad emotions and replaced them with good emotions. Mm -hmm. And my new selfishness is basically, I'm just working on myself. I come mm -hmm. first. I had to tell my daughter years ago, like three years ago, I told my daughter that I come first and she didn't quite understand at first, but now she does. She understands if mm -hmm. I just take care of myself and everything else is going to be okay mm -hmm. and everything's going to fall in my lap. And that's mm -hmm. what keeps happening. Yeah. I think there's a big difference between uh, self-care and selfishness, right? Where the, yes. the selfishness is, you know, as a potential to harm others or do something that uh, doesn't align with uh, maybe my values or... right. Uh, or what's the right thing to do. But then the, the self-care side of things is saying, if I invest in myself first, mm -hmm. I prioritize me, um, then I have all of that goodness to be able to share and contribute where I think that when we're in addiction, <clears throat> we're doing all the self-harm stuff and all these things that aren't good for us. Mm -hmm. And then we have to be selfish to get our needs met and trample over other people's needs yeah, in the process. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 Was, that was me for a while, for sure. Uh -huh. And but before that, the selfishness was also uh, being a people pleaser. Mm. I was actually being selfish by trying to help everyone, mm. trying to fix everyone. That's what was really happening. Mm. I would try and help people, and I was technically trying to fix them and control them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the big realization. Tell me more about that. I had you, to, get, to get rid of that, and yeah. you know, in a work environment, I'd be upset about everything. People didn't do things I liked. I'd get upset about it. Mm -hmm. I, what value do you think that that provided for you? None. <laughs> but what did yeah, you think? I mean, I mean, it must have had a perceived value, right? Yeah. It well, yeah, definitely a, a perceived so what was, value. What was the was, perceived value? You think it was you know? yeah, me trying to teach everyone to 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 use their indicators when they're turning right, and mm -hmm. just it was control, and that that value to me was I could make the whatever better, my world better, mm -hmm. if if I'm making money for example and somebody does something that affects me making money then i'm going to be upset with them mm -hmm. and it and it's really just all on me i mm -hmm. to let that go, control go yeah, is it fair to say there's a because uh, that sounds like fear to me that sounds like mm -hmm. a, oh for sure a sense of fear right yeah for sure it was fear of failure low self-esteem which we talked about on monday we did we had yes. a very long talk about low self-esteem yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that is that was the root cause of my alcoholism Mm -hmm. You know, number 10, there was probably 10 root causes. Mm -hmm. That was one. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you elaborate a little bit on how, I mean, we did just talk about self-esteem, but how, you know, how did the alcohol, alcohol play a role in, in the self-esteem? Well, it gave me esteem. <laughs> it, it made me the life of the party. It made mm -hmm. me funnier, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, more friends, so to speak. Mm -hmm. We were never friends, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, it was... I don't think about it. <laughs> so a false, a false sense of, yeah, a yeah. false sense of, of self-esteem. And then, yeah. yeah, I, I think that what a lot of people don't recognize is the, the value that needs play. So when we look at the drugs or alcohol that we're using, they usually fulfill a need. So if you say it makes me the life of the party, mm -hmm. so my need would be to be seen and to be important or to be accepted or loved or whatever that need may be, mm -hmm. right? Then I go to the drug of choice that provides that need in a false way. Yeah. It doesn't do it the way we think that it's doing it. Uh, and then my natural capacity to be that person starts to 
dissipate. I start to atrophy those skills because yes. now I only know how to do it with drugs and alcohol. So those needs aren't being fulfilled at a at a bigger level. So I have mm -hmm. to figure those things out, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to figure them out now. They just happen. Like I spent 40, 50 years trying to make people like me. Mm -hmm. And now people just love me mm -hmm. for who I am. And mm -hmm. if they don't, they're just not part of my life, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's easier. It's a lot easier now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, so but what's, you know, what is the, what is the big piece of it? Like, what is it? Like, that's such a profound statement to say, you know, people just love me now. Right. I guess it's, it's just what I put out there. Ah. It's what I put out to the universe and it just comes oh. back. Okay. And it's been, I mean, I'm 18 months sober tomorrow. Okay. And in the last 18 months, I've had more things fall in my lap than I, it's, it's unbelievable sometimes mm -hmm. that, just good things keep happening because I keep doing the right things. And okay, what's so your, what's... naturally people are going to be drawn to me because uh -huh. I am relaxed now, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, for the most part. Mm -hmm. Right, the ADHD can still take over, <laughs> 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 which I was diagnosed with when I was fifty, mm -hmm. and, and I thought, okay, well, I didn't know anything about it. I always just joked about it. Mm -hmm. Then it started to make sense, and I started to connect the dots to alcoholism. Mm -hmm. it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly has a role uh, mm -hmm. in that. So what's the difference between uh, how you feel about yourself now versus how you felt about yourself when you're in active addiction? Mm -hmm. That's a big question, but I, I would love for you to, you know, kind of say what's the what's the difference? <laughs> it's, there's, there are hundreds of differences. I wake up happy and I, I live in the moment. You had a post the other day about living in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I thank you for that because I was driving to St. Mary's and I, was looking at the trees instead of mm. thinking about what do I have to do with this? What do I have to do with that? Who do I have to do? What do I have to pay? You know, I was just driving and, mm -hmm. and enjoying my time. Mm -hmm. That's a small piece of it. And mm. it's just the constant calm and being able to do new things and wake up in the morning and have a nice bath and work out and do all these lovely things that I couldn't do before. I didn't mm -hmm. want to. And mm -hmm. It sounds like going to the gym on a Saturday night. I never went to the gym on a Saturday <laughs> night. Now I'm always there on a Saturday night. <laughs> so lots, lots of self care, and and it sounds lots like there's a there's a sense of uh, gratitude as well. Yeah, every day, always grateful. Mm -hmm. Every morning, I, you know, wake up, feel grateful, remind myself of how grateful I am. I have a grateful jar that I created last year and mm -hmm. put sticky notes in uh, for everything I was grateful for and people. Places, things, whatever it was. You have a um, write it down. You, is that the jar there? This is no. This is my square jar. Oh, okay. Um, part two. Uh, the first part's gone somewhere, but I made a square jar when my daughter was young. Okay. And I put the words can't, should, hate, some other words. I yeah, yeah. Wouldn't let her use those words. Okay. She swears like a trucker now, but but I, I taught her. But those are better than the word hate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So. Um, yeah, and then I recreated it again and started adding words. As I heard, mm. you know, when I was going through my recovery, people said, where is your willpower? Well, I just don't need that word anymore. Like, mm -hmm. there's no willpower. It's it's beyond that. Mm -hmm. It's it's about me and, and improving my life. And mm -hmm. so I wrote willpower on there and perfect. We don't need that word, right? Crazy, mm -hmm. lazy. And uh, weak and strong. Weak was something I heard a lot in recovery. Mm. No, I, talking about weakness, just it, it shouldn't be used when you're dealing with addiction at all. And then recently I added the word strong because I'm beyond strong. I'm not, it's not that I'm strong because I'm not having a drink anymore. I'm, I'm knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. my, my emotional... Intelligence is improved. Mm -hmm. That's a better word than strong or mm -hmm. term, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's something I like, and it was full of change, but I dumped it in my Jeep before I got in here. So, all right. So, <laughs> anybody wants some extra change? There's a Jeep in the parking lot at yeah. Roger's studio. You can go get the change. Yes. <laughs> we'll be long gone by the time this airs. <laughs> yes. Um, I appreciate that, and I recognize the value that words have uh, in how we interact and how we think and feel and emote. So, Drawing attention to those things is certainly 
must have a value in what it's doing for you right now. Yeah. So we're gonna we're at the halfway mark. So we're gonna take a really quick break. And we'll be right back. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Invisible: Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction, where we're having a conversation with Trevor Hopkins. Trevor, uh, we're gonna segue this conversation into something that we've never talked about on this show, and it's something that. Uh, we recognize has its own stigma and shame attached to it as well. So uh, again, I want to thank you for being on the show and being able to be vulnerable and talk about this very touchy subject. Um, and what I want to talk about is impaired driving. So knowing that you've had an impaired driving charge, it's very rare that people would want to talk about that in a public sense, in a public forum about what that looks like or the impacts that it has because there's so much shame or potential for hazard and harm. And there's a lot of people that have been traumatized by that specific thing. So mm -hmm. um, the the capacity to, for you to be here on the show and talk about it is is uh, is greatly appreciated again. And so thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to ask you, can you just tell me a little bit about your impaired charge and, and then we'll kind of go from there. Sure. I, uh, I'm happy to. I, mean, I, I talk to a lot of people about it. Just, I try and stop people from doing it mm -hmm. ultimately mm -hmm. and uh although i don't think anything could have stopped me from drinking and driving the day that that i did mm -hmm. uh, well a lot of a lot of um mental health awareness for the 20 years prior might have helped mm -hmm. because i wouldn't have been in that situation mm -hmm. uh, or i would have prepared for that situation but that the day that i got in my vehicle and i drove to godridge and I thought I'd lost everything, my, my daughter, my dog, my house, all of it. And I was just at a loss and God was just a bit of a sacred, sacred place for me. So I, in my mind, I just wanted to go there. I, I had thoughts driving into the marina. I had other thoughts of just driving down a dirt road and sleeping it off and going home. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately I passed out in the McDonald's drive through, mm -hmm. let my foot off the gas apparently and drove out onto the highway and. Mm -hmm. People saw me, and you, know, you mentioned um, you know, people being hurt. The witnesses that called in, I, I was able to read their statements. I heard them just out of fear. They thought, because they probably thought I had a stroke or a heart attack, or mm -hmm. they didn't know. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that I hurt without really even thinking about it mm -hmm. that, that were affected by it. So I, um, Fortunately, was slowing down. I bumped into a vehicle, and no one was hurt. And I'm grateful for that every day. At the same time, I'm grateful that that uh, um, I'm grateful for all of it. Really, I mean, it's 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 really helped me out. Mm -hmm. I'm lost where I'm going right now with this, but um, it was a tough day. It was a really tough day, and uh, but now I'm. So I'm going to go right, I'm going to go right at it. There's people that, you know, say, well, just don't do it. Like you just don't drink and drive. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not that easy. So, you know, if you don't mind, you know, what was going through your head when you, you know, picked up the keys and went and jumped in the car, like you talked about where you were going and what you were doing, but was there, you know, any negotiation or, or, or I don't things think so. happening inside your mind that said don't or whatever? No, I'd had enough. Mm -hmm. I was, I, I just had gone through six months of, of hell mm -hmm. and I'm selling my house. There's all kinds of bad things that were happening. Again, there's the selfishness, right? Mm -hmm. It was all about me. It, it was, mm -hmm. this is happening to me and I don't care. And, and mm -hmm. I need to escape mm -hmm. and I was escaping with more than just alcohol. And mm -hmm. I didn't drink and drive before I, like my mother said, she said, well, you use keys please all the time. Mm -hmm. I said, not, not that day. I didn't care about anybody. I didn't mm -hmm. care about me. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's part where we can see that there's, uh, you know, our, our brains kind of go on autopilot. Yeah. So we have, things, sure. we, have, we have things that we just do. I brush my teeth, I put on my pants, I get in the car, I make a sandwich, I open the fridge, I go to the potty. Like all those things that I do and I just mm -hmm. kind of do them without even thinking about. And I think that some people don't recognize that then when we're intoxicated, we kind of do things on, in an autopilot kind of sense of thing in the subconscious mind and we're intoxicated and impaired and our judgment is just not there, right? And mm -hmm. we just kind of do things. So yep. I just kind of talking about the idea of, you know, 
Uh, and any of the viewers at home go, what do you mean you didn't think about it, right? I think there's didn't, more to I, I yeah. think there's more to that than just like choosing to not think about it. Yeah, I, I, I hear a lot of people like, they will say, well, what about the sign on Horton that says you just blew 10 grand? I said, well, not 10 grand, it's 25 grand for starters. Mm. <laughs> and nobody thinks about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it, it's just in another place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that we see those signs, we recognize the impacts but uh, there's part of it where we're kind of disconnected. That's not me. Like, I mean, we see all of the horror stories of anything, you know, smoking, eating, uh, lack sure. of exercise, whatever. And we go, oh, that's not me. And we still kind of mm -hmm. do that. So those things uh, kind of desensitize us. I think some of those, you just blew 10 grand. Yeah. Um, but the 25 grand seems like I've heard the same thing and seen that worked with many individuals with substance use disorders and impaired charges. Um, and that's a more reasonable number sometimes is up in the 20, depending on what happened. Sure. Uh, what were some of the things that were the expenses? Like, what, what were you spending money? And people are like, what do you mean 20? What am legal, I spending it on? Yeah, legal, yeah. Uber. Uber was incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. We were kind of in lockdown stage around the, that time. So I was ordering groceries anyways, but mm -hmm. it was all those extra expenses. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, the legal insurance. You know, my insurance went from 106 a month to 841 a month. $841 mm -hmm. a month. Yeah. And that'll that's... last for a couple of years. That right. That's a huge expense. Huge. Yeah. I'd, um, I didn't flinch when I got the quote. I called mm -hmm. my sponsor and I said, I'm not upset. <laughs> I, I wasn't upset. It was just mind boggling. Mm -hmm. that... But again, I'm accepting these things. I don't mm -hmm. have control over it. I did something wrong. I got to pay for it now. Mm hmm will be gone someday. My insurance will go back down again. Yeah. Um, I think uh, really quick, I don't think people realize that when something like that happens, you still have to pay your regular monthly insurance plus your your car payment while you're Ubering and your and your oh yeah and your license is suspended. Yeah. So you, you, you're, that was you're another doubling one. you're doubling up on those those expenses and bills and then there's also the cost of uh impound. Yeah, the impound was a lot. Thousand dollars for seven days. Yeah. Uh, that was a big one and Mm -hmm. Um, the cost now I'm like the, the breathalyzer that I have in my vehicle, mm. I mean, it's a hundred dollars a month. It's, it's not too much, but just all those added costs. And, right. Oh, and the reinstatement fee. So when you lose your license, um, it used to be $150 to reinstate your license. Mm -hmm. Now it's $800 mm -hmm. just to walk in and mm -hmm. sign in. Mm -hmm. That's after 90 days. So that's, that's the reinstatement fee. And then mm -hmm. again, after losing my license for a year by the courts, I had to reinstate my license again and mm -hmm. another 800 plus, 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 plus. Yeah. Wow. Let's go to 30 grand, shall we? Yeah. I'm going to go to Horton keep, and change that. Yeah, so yeah, we can keep, uh, <laughs> yeah, we can keep adding it. Depending on whether or not you want to go through legal fees and stuff like that, I'm sure that there's variables, but still, yeah, it adds up. It yeah. adds up pretty quick. So, um, the financial costs, I think, are are pretty straight line and easy to talk about. What about some of the the other costs, the personal, emotional, um, you know, the problems? You know, I know it, there's a lot of explanations and conversations we have to have with family members about it and mm -hmm. asking friends for rides. Like, there's other other costs. What were some of the other costs for you that really stood out? Emotional costs, the constant reliving of the incident and... Actually, there was the, the vehicle that I had hit, um, I had gotten out, I had a boot on my foot, so I was limping and I went to the lady and I gave her my insurance. And then when I was, I went back to my vehicle, mm -hmm. there was a little girl that stuck her head out and she looked at me like she was concerned for me. Mm -hmm. And that's always stuck in my mind. I think that's, that really helped me be grateful mm -hmm. because I, I thought that something just happened and this little girl's looking at me like she's concerned about me. So it's not an emotional cost. It's quite the opposite, actually. So there were a lot of good emotions that came from it. Mm -hmm. Definitely the emotional cost and the embarrassment in the beginning. And but that went away. I can blow my breathalyzer and not have to hide. You know, you see some people they mm -hmm. they they duck down to blow on their breathalyzer and they're mm -hmm. they're still ashamed of their of mm -hmm. their DUI. For sure. Uh, so the viewers understand we're talking about a, an interlock device that yes. you have to blow into to get the key to work so your car won't start unless you have a zero blood alcohol percentage before right. you can get the cars to start. Yep. So that's another part of uh, the process and the day-to-day -day things that you have to do as a it result is. 
And it's a constant reminder, I'm assuming. Of- oh, it's for sure. It's a constant reminder. And, you know, it, it, it's those added minutes where you've mm. got to go and turn the key, wait for it to warm up and mm. wait for it and wait and wait and wait. And, mm. and then it goes off randomly. So, yeah. So I, real quick, I'd love to talk about that. So when you're driving, all of a sudden it beeps while you're driving and says, okay, now you have to blow randomly five minutes into your drive to prove that someone else didn't blow it to start the car for you mm-hmm. so that while you're moving, you can prove that you're still you and sober. Yep. Right. So that's a, that's a bigger deal. What happens if you don't blow into it? You get a, you get a, um, you get a, um, a violation. Yeah. If you get too many, vi- I think three violations, they start to uh, put fees onto you. I had I, mm-hmm. my Jeep in the shop for a weekend and it cost me a hundred dollars in fines. <laughs> so yeah. just cause they weren't blowing in it in time. But that's oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. They, they could have called um, to let them know it was in the shop. It just kind of happened mm-hmm. quick. So. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so more costs. <clears throat> right. If you don't blow in it or I actually had a banana and blew in it and and it breached me or whichever term you want to use. Mm. That's it, it sensed the, the alcohol in, in a banana. In the fruit. Yeah. 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 yeah it's I've pretty sensitive. That. I've I've heard that. And hand yeah. sanitizer and other things. Hand san- I had hand sanitizer in my vehicle and yeah. I had to move it because it was in the, yeah. you know, by the, the emergency brake there. Yeah. Too I, close. Yeah. There's so many things to talk about right now. Uh, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to you know, talk about a little bit more about, you know, quickly about what the, you know, the, the, uh, the takeaways are, you know, what, what are the big learnings? What are the things that you get from this? Um, and, and, and is there any advice you would give to people out there? Yeah. Focus on your mental health. That's what it all comes down to. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that earlier, and I think as, as, as humans, we are focusing on mental health more and more and more. Canadians, especially, we did the push-up challenge last month. You and I, yeah, yeah. Shoulder still hurts, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But, uh, for the viewers, there is a push-up challenge on Canadian mental health. Um, but yeah, it's those little things that that I forgot where I was going. Sorry. <laughs> All good. All good. So uh, working on the mental health, individuals yeah. helping work. Yeah, on and understanding health. yourself better. If you know yourself yeah. better and can admit to your to your faults and your shortcomings and mm-hmm. deal with them and admit them and right. work on them. Right. Maybe you won't be in a situation where life is lost. Right. You want to do something stupid. Thanks for being on the show today, Trevor. There's something that I that I hear that is screaming out from you right now, and it's this idea that um, uh, ownership and responsibility of the things that in my life and the actions that I take really uh, chip away at uh, shame, and it chips mm-hmm. away at me not feeling good about myself when I just own up and take it. Yeah. And you can't take any more ownership than being on television talking about yeah. it. So I, yeah. I, I yeah. appreciate you being on the show and being vulnerable. Thanks again. Very well. And thank you for watching Invisible, Breaking Through the Stigma of Addiction, and we'll see you next time.